My name is Jordan Graves, uh, J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-A-V, is in Victor E.S. Sir, could you tell the jury what you do for a living? I am a senior digital forensic examiner at the FBI. And what do you do as a senior digital forensic examiner? It's my job to acquire data from evidence items, evidence material, to analyze that data, make it uh, reviewable, searchable, categorized, and allow investigators or other interested parties to review that data. From there, I would produce reports of data of interest and then potentially give presentations on those findings like I'm doing today. And uh, how long have you been doing that sort of work for the FBI? I've been involved in the uh, forensic examiner program uh, in general since 2013. And what sort of training and education do you have uh, to do the type of work that you do? So prior to my involvement in this program, I earned a master's degree in media forensics from the University of Colorado at Denver. Upon entering the program, um, anybody that enters, enters in as a trainee, so an examiner that needs to go through some training. <coughs> that training includes over 400 hours of classroom training as well as additional uh, certifications and tests that need to be passed and gained in order to proceed, as well as some practical exercises as well. So many, many hundreds of hours of training, uh, hands-on and in the classroom. And um, when it comes to the, the field of uh, performing extractions of cellular devices, um, have you testified as an expert in that field before? Yes, I have. And approximately how many times? Specific to that field, um, multiple times for the Circuit Court of Cook County, that's where uh, Chicago is in Illinois. Um, I've testified as an expert additionally at the Northern District of Illinois, that's federal court, uh, again, Chicagoland area. Um, and then I've also testified as an expert in uh, a military court proceeding at the U.S. Uh, Marine uh, Air Station Cherry Point, so basically a uh, court martial. I've testified as a forensic expert. Yes. Um, and is it fair to say that the two GPS locations are not entirely the same for those two periods of time? That's correct. The values are different. And um, would it also be fair to say there's, there's other varying GPS values contained in this document? Is that correct? Yes. Um, now, based on your role as a senior digital forensic examiner, some familiarity with how uh, the GPS system works? Yes, a little bit. And, and can you explain to the jury just what the GPS system is as a general matter? So GPS stands for a Global Positioning System. It's a series of satellites that orbit the Earth that help uh, triangulate or locate devices with GPS antennas. Um, basically, uh, you have an antenna on a given device, whether that's a phone or a designated, dedicated GPS unit. I don't know if anybody ever had those handheld handheld units that we used to have and put in our cars or vehicles, um, as well as the uh, GPS transponding devices that are included in a lot of newer cars these days. A lot of people can use turn-by-turn -turn directions right in their car. Um, so those devices have antennas that communicate back and forth with these orbiting satellites to try and provide locations for where you are and assist you in navigating wherever you're trying to navigate to. And uh, did you have an opportunity to plot out uh, some of the GPS coordinates reflected in this Exhibit 42? I did, yes, a sampling of them. And, and what did you find when you plotted out that, that sampling of coordinates? 
So for the court, that I had. Uh, Your Honor, I would object. Uh, I believe this is a, a witness who's qualified to, I guess, testify about the GPS coordinates. He even used the word, the qualifying that he knows a little bit about GPS. So he's an expert in forensic extraction, but I don't believe he's an expert as far as global positioning <laughs> system on how it works or the coordinates um, are and be able to compare different coordinates to different coordinates, Your Honor. So I believe that this witness is not the right witness. Well, extraction and analysis. And but he testified that he knows little about GPS, a little. He used those words himself. Can you ask another question? Sure. Um, <laughs> sir, when, when you said you knew a little bit about GPS system, what do you mean by that? I meant that I didn't design GPS systems. Um, it's not my primary job to track devices with GPS systems. Um, just as a user of devices that have GPS enabled and uh, as an experienced examiner who has reviewed GPS location data on given evidence sources. Um, that is what my expertise is in. Okay, and within your area of expertise, do you have experience analyzing GPS data uh, that has been extracted from cellular devices? I do. And um, are you able to testify and use some of that experience um, in terms of uh, interpreting the data uh, reflected in Exhibit 42? Yes. Okay. Um, so did you plot out, you said you plotted out a sampling of some of the GPS coordinates um, in this particular document? I did. And what did you find when you plotted out those coordinates? Um, those plot points, when applied to a map, um, fall within a ger general area. Uh, but to be more specific, more precise, the two furthest plot points that I had placed and mapped and measured uh, vary by about 19 meters, which is somewhere between five and six feet. Or, I'm sorry, the other way around. Five meters, 19 feet. So a 19 foot variance between uh, these furthest points that I mapped. Okay, and were all those points consistent with being in and around the area of 1366 Juliet Place in Detroit? Yes. And um, now, based on your experience of uh, interpreting GPS data, um, is that sort of variance consistent with the device moving during that period of time? It could be moving or stationary to have uh, variance in GPS records. And, and how could it be stationary if there's deviations in, in GPS points from one time to another? Your Honor, I reject, we're getting into speculation now. He's speculating that truly he's not an expert in this particular situation. So he's asking him to speculate on an area that's beyond his expertise. Well, Judge, he's qualified to testify in this, and the defense opened the door to this by speculating that the device was moving at the not, time. Well, not with this witness. This is an improper witness. If he wanted to cross-examine the witness that I that, that I crossed on, if he wanted to direct this partic that particular right. witness, but this and, is a whole different and witness. And that's why we asked senior digital forensic examiner Graves to look at this data because he has more experience with the GPS system and testifying about this than Detective Marcos. And, and I don't believe he's ever said he's been qualified as an expert in global positioning systems and testifying in that. He's testified that he was been certified as an expert in extraction, but not as far as analyzing global position. And he's just not the right witness. What sort of uh, experience or training do you have when it comes to interpreting GPS data? So, um, as you can imagine, with uh, mobile devices being on <coughs> people's persons or being in people's vehicles, um, location data is very prevalent with the evidence that I've worked on in my career. We're talking about uh, many hundreds of requests for assistance, all of those requests constituting potentially multiple evidence items. So thousands and thousands of evidence items that I've examined personally, um, many of them contain some kind of a location aspect. And many times the location information is significant, at least as communicated to me by the case agent or whoever's requesting my assistance. So I do have a lot of work experience uh, working on evidence data, specifically looking for location data, providing that data to the requester or the investigator. Um, as well as plotting that data out using um, a readily available service like, uh, like Google Earth or Google Maps. It's, it's fairly simple and straightforward to uh, enter in latitudes and longitudinal values in those fields and then to see where those plot points land. Okay. 
this is pretty trivial process. And, and, and Judge, I just think that despite that ex expressive, I mean, impressive uh, dialogue that he just um, stated, that he didn't indicate none of his training, whether or not he was certified or any type of outsources that he was ever qualified as a witness, as an expert witness. He stated that he has I done it in the past. Question. So, um, w when it comes to the, the training that you had with the FBI, does any of that training specifically address uh, anything having to do with the global positioning system? Yes. And can you elaborate on that? So, some of the training that we receive um, provided by the FBI uh, covers and deals with locations and how location data is recovered from evidence items and how it should be interpreted. In addition to the internal training provided by the FBI, there's also external training that I've attended, uh, which includes training provided by an organization called the SANS organization. It's a, it's a uh, tool neutral, um, uh, vendor neutral organization that provides training to uh, folks in the public sector and the private sector on a variety of different uh, informational technology aspects. So security, forensics, incident response, uh, one of those courses is an advanced smartphone or mobile device uh, forensic course. It's six days long, I work all day, and you have a certification at the end, which I've earned. And as part of that training, some of the objectives of the training days include recovering and interpreting location data. As part of your experience recovering and interpreting location data, and as part of your training when it comes to location data, have you ever um, encountered situations with very small fluctuations in GPS data, like the uh, example that we have here in Exhibit 42. Yes. And can you, um, I, I guess, can you explain what your experience is in, in sort of interpreting those sorts of small deviations from GPS data? So based on my training experience, um, GPS records come with an inherent margin of error. It's not going to be accurate down to the centimeter or to the inch necessarily. There are a whole lot of variables that come into place when GPS records are produced. Um, the system itself is a series of orbiting satellites around the Earth that are constantly moving and trying to connect to however many devices are, are using those satellites. The devices themselves may be moving or may be stationary. The Earth itself is orbiting the sun and rotating. And upon the Earth, the devices in question may either be, <coughs> excuse me, may either be in an open field or somewhere without much man-made or natural obstruction, or the devices could be residing somewhere where there might be more natural and man-made obstruction. So, uh, mountain ranges, large buildings, poured concrete and rebar, um, all of these type of um, places, all these types of, of structures that are on your surface can obstruct uh, GPS signal, signal to satellites. And so hypothetically, if, if you had GPS data from a device that was perfectly stationary over the period of, of five hours, would you expect that GPS data to be uniform for that entire five hour period? In a real world application, I would expect the GPS rate records to potentially fluctuate at least a little. Um, now, in terms of um, your extraction and processing of uh, data uh, when it comes to cellular devices, um, what sort of program, what sort of computer program do you use to, uh, to process data from a cellular device? So the tools that we use as forensic examiners, uh, they can vary depending on what kinds of evidence that you're looking to conduct your examinations on. Uh, two of the more popular ones, not just for the FBI, but across the forensics industry, we're talking about other public sector groups as well as private sector entities, include uh, Celebrite, the Celebrite suite, and uh, Axiom. Axiom is a, a product that's made by a company called Mag Magnet Forensics. And they both effectively achieve the same goals, which is to take an extracted data set and to parse through that data set. When I say parse, I mean iterate through the data set, read the data, this big long string of characters, letters, numbers, and then make interpretations about what that content may be. And then 
present them to you as lists of possible artifacts, location data, device information, uh, chats, internet activity, um, any of the data that you might anticipate would be populated on a mobile device could potentially be recovered uh, from these tools. Now, are Celebrate and Axiom the same exact computer program? They're not. Um, if, hypothetically, you were to take the same data set and process it with both Celebrate and Axiom, would you expect to see the same exact results? I would expect the results to be largely consistent with each other with the possibility of some minor changes between each two resulting data sets because you have to remember these, these tools are developed by separate companies written by separate engineers using separate coding language and they're private companies that are trying to make money so the, the interest in them is maintaining their intellectual property, maintaining that code. I don't even get to see that code. Um, so they won't know what each other are writing, therefore you would anticipate that the results would be at least slightly different. Um, that's why it's important for us as forensic examiners to be generally tool agnostic, meaning using a tool, using multiple tools, verifying results, and being as sure as you can of what it is that you're seeing. And um, in connection with the investigation of the death of Samantha Wool, did you obtain raw data from an iPhone associated with I did. And did that data come from the Detroit Police Department? It did, yes. And when you obtained that data, that raw data, what did you do with that data? Uh, that data, as I understood it, had already been processed using the Celebrate forensic suite, so <coughs> I used uh, Axiom as requested because at the time, to my understanding, uh, Axiom wasn't available for that DPD personnel to use. Okay. And um, when you process the data using, using Axiom, you able to generate uh, a, a sort of overall report of the data? Uh, yes, sort of a, uh, an encapsulation of all the different kinds of artifacts that Axiom had recovered from the given data set. Uh, that set of results was generated, yes. Okay, and did I ask you um, to come prepared to authenticate uh, a subset of, of sort of extraction reports from the overall data set? You did ask me that, yes. Okay, and did you uh, go into your overall uh, sort of body of data from the, the Axiom program and confirm the authenticity of those reports? I did. Okay. Um, I'm holding first what's been marked as People's Proposed Exhibit 126 in the intro chart. Um, proposed Exhibit 126, a, a report that includes some information about certain app installation data. Uh, yes, this is uh, a series of records pertaining to app installation, yes. And um, in terms of the apps that are referenced, um, is it specific to scanner-related apps? Yes, they all, based on package name, they all have a scanner or a police scanner, um, that sort of language uh, in the name of the app package, yes. And again, if you were to go back into um, your 
your sort of overall uh, report from Axiom and pull that same document? Could you do that today? Yes. Your Honor, I moved to admit the post to the Same objections. Okay. Well, and um, I just have a couple of questions about uh, this exhibit. Just on the cover sheet, what is where it says case number? What, what sort of information does that reflect? So the whole series of numbers following that case number entry. The first portion, DE, stands for Detroit. That's the identifier that the FBI uses to indicate what field office <coughs> this particular case is being worked out of, so Detroit. Uh, the following seven numbers are a unique number assigned to a given case. So using that DE and then those seven numbers, that would tell you which case it is that all this information pertains to. In this case, it was a, an assist to local law enforcement. Um, the next six numbers, that 288734, that is a request number. So that number is generated when a request is made specifically to me or individuals that are on my team in Detroit um, to assist in a case. So using that first portion, that DE383, et cetera, et cetera, and then that request number, um, examiners that work in the FBI that have access to uh, request records would be able to see this is a request for assistance on this given case and you'd be able to see the details for that given request. The last portion, that 248-906-5529 is the phone number associated with the device that is being extracted and examined within this uh, report. I want to ask you about record number seven uh, in the report. Okay. And um, what, what sort of information can we glean from this specific record? So there are a series of rows depicted in this record, uh, action, package name, date and time, local time, um, source, location, evidence number, recovery method, and item ID. Uh, the first one, action, install, successful. This is the generic uh, summary provided by Axiom of what a given event is, so a successful installation, as Axiom is reporting. Uh, for package name, this is insight into what app is actually being installed, that com.radio.police.scanner.scanner is going to be the information of relevance or of importance telling you what sort of application is being installed. Uh, date time, local time, that is the date and time that the application was installed. And local time is significant because a lot of times in, uh, when we're talking about computers or mobile devices, the time isn't necessarily based on your time zone. It's based on something called UTC, which doesn't account for time zones. It's this universal cutoff time somewhere in uh, Europe is where this takes place. And then from there, you would have to adjust for your time zone minus four hours or five hours or six hours as you go into different time zones. And then obviously changing to daylight savings where that's observed. Um, but this local time specific portion uh, gets around that and tells you what the local time to the device was uh, at the time of this record. Uh, source, this is where this record is actually pulled from on the extracted data. So if you were to connect to this phone, say, to your computer and navigate through it like a thumb drive, like you were looking for family photos or something, this would be the series of folders you would have to navigate to and the file you would have to open to see this record. So you can walk right through it every time there's a backward slash, that's a new folder you'd have to open. And then finally, this mobile underscore installation dot log dot zero, that's the name of the log where this record came from. Um, underneath that is location. This is the quasi-physical place on the device of where this data exists, not in terms of within these digital folders, but actually on the device. Um, it's different with mobile devices because with computers, uh, the, the language we used to use was for 
uh, spinning hard drives that actually have physical platters that have information stored on them with uh, these uh, flash storage devices that we refer to as flash. There isn't a, a spinning mechanism or moving parts that constitutes this, this storage mechanism. It's all chemistry. It's all chemical reactions. It's all electronics on chips. Um, but anyway, that offset, that location is where in the stored medium this record would be. Um, below that is evidence number. That is just the name of the source that this data ultimately came from. So you'll see it's uh, HF23-273, which I was led to believe is the uh, case number for the Detroit Police Department. Then Apple iPhone XR is what it says. 248-906-5529 dump file dot zip. That dot zip is an archive. It's an encapsulation of the data extracted from the phone in one container. Underneath that, recovery method parsing. That just means through its normal iteration process, the software found this record and is displaying it. It didn't have to do any kind of advanced analytics or uh, second passes through or anything like that. It's just traversing through, finding it, recording it. And then finally, item ID. This would be a unique identification number within this Axiom processing session pertaining to that record. So as you go through all of the records for all of the artifacts that were re recovered from this device, all within the same session, each record would have an individual ID number. And that is all the information listed here. And if we go to record eight, what's the, what's the next action that's reflected there? The next action that's reflected there is uninstalling identifier. And um, can you say anything about what that means? Um, an identifier, I mean, it depends on the context, um, but in a lot of times when phones and computers are doing normal day-to-day user-related things, tasks, um, there's a lot more that happens in the background than folks may understand. For instance, if you're simply typing in a Word document, um, the things that are going on in the background of that computer aren't just placing letters within that document. There might be a whole bunch of background system things that are happening at the same time to best manage the user experience, to best keep the thing operating in an optimal fashion. And so this uninstalling identifier record uh, following shortly behind the install successful record within, within two minutes and pertaining to the same package, that COM radio police scanner scanner, uh, just a sort of system maintenance uh, maintaining uh, this application. Okay. Um, and if we go down to uh, record 19, um, can you just, uh, I guess, briefly summarize the, the action, the package name, and the date and time associated with this record? <coughs> so for record 9, the action made container live. Sorry, um, record 19. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, down sorry on about that. page 7. Mm -hmm. So record 19, um, the action install successful, so same action that we had from the previous covered record. The package name for this one is uh, a placeholder COM Sepia Software Police Scanner, so that would be the name of the application that was being installed. Um, date and time, local time, uh, 2023 11 3, which is November 3rd, uh, 223034, that'll be 1030 at night. Um, source, that's the location of where this record was recovered from, from the data set. Uh, location, the physical location on the media item. Evidence number, this is that same container that contained all that extracted data from the <coughs> phone. And then item ID, you'll see is a different uh, record identifying number than the previous one discussed. Okay, and then if we go down to record 20. So the package name listed for record 24, right? Correct. 
Uh, that's net Gordon Edwards scanner hyphen radio hyphen deluxe. Uh, that's not a package name that's been discussed previously by me. Yeah. Okay, and so how many package names relating to scanners have we discussed so far? So this would be the third one by my count. Okay, and what's the, what's the date and time associated with this particular action in Record 24? Record 24, the local date and time for uh, this made container live uh, entry is 2023 November 3rd 235756 so that would be 1157 p.m. All right and um, did I also ask you to authenticate uh, a document pertaining to some internet search history you did um, and I'm holding I think we're at a good point to break for lunch and come back I'm sorry but it's always going to have to follow this will just take minutes and I'll be done if the oh, okay. um, I'm holding what's been marked as proposed exhibit fifty two and I approach. Um is proposed exhibit fifty two a report that reflects a uh, an artifact of a particular web search that you located in the data from the defendant's phone? Yes, this document details uh, web searches that were recovered from this uh, given phone data set, yes. And again, if you were to go back into the overall extraction from Axiom, could you generate that same document today? Yes. Uh, I need to admit proposed to the 52. Oh, good. People's 52 is admitted. And um, if we scroll down to uh, page for record one, um, could you indicate what the search term was associated with this particular record? So the search term, which would be the, the phrase, the term or phrase or words that were entered by a device user, um, is black light sees what with a question mark at the end. And is there a particular date and time associated with that search, with that search term? There is. And what is the uh, date and time? The search session start date and time is 10 2023, so October 30th, 2023, at 2.19.18 a.m. UTC. So this goes back to what we were talking about before, where uh, information may be stored either with a local time or in UTC, where you would have to manually uh, account for that time difference uh, based on time zones. Okay. And um, are the other records uh, contained in this exhibit duplicative of with this record? The search terms for the remaining records are the same, yes. Okay, thank you. Nothing further. Just to clarify, the UTC time adjustment will be what for the metrics So depending on the time of year, depending if daylight savings is in place, it would I'm either not there. It would be minus four or minus five. I think it's minus four for this time of year, but I'm not exactly certain when the daylight savings comes into or out of effect. I'd have and to double check. Either so you'd have to subtract four 10, hours. Ten or nine, eighteen. Right, of the previous day, yes. I just want to clarify because no one ever said what the time is. Um, is your cross really lengthy? Do you want to wait till after lunch? Understood. We're going to break for lunch. It's almost 12.15 right now.